GaryCon is an annual gathering of Gygax family members, friends of my father's, and fellow game enthusiasts uh, from all over the country and the world. And we get together to remember my father and uh, honor him by doing what he loved best, playing games. It's a memorial convention that grew out of an event after his funeral. He passed away March 4th of 2008. Uh, we had a you know, relatively small funeral service. And then afterwards, I thought it would be appropriate to have a gathering in the American Legion Hall in Lake Geneva, which was the site of Gen Con 2, and a lot of fond memories for me and my family. My you know, sisters brought some pizza, and uh, we just had tables set up and played games and uh, people were shaking dice and playing various games and, and and having a good time remembering my dad and even though it was a sad moment just to have being together with all those people was really cathartic for my family i'm not sure who said it uh, but someone said wow luke this is a great idea you should do this every year and uh i think it was jolly blackburn said you can call it gary con because they have a, a character in knights of the dinner table gary jackson which is a cross between my dad gary gygax and steve jackson so and they have gary con which is supposed to be like gen con so uh, uh i thought that was that was fun and so gary con was born lake geneva is the mecca of role-playing gaming because uh, that's where my uh, father wrote dungeons and dragons in the house on 330 center street it's not just my hometown it's where dungeons and dragons was created it's where tsr was headquartered all those years and there's a lot of creative people who still live in that area and so that's uh, really important that we're there and uh, remember the foundation of the industry as well as what my father did for it. there's a feeling of camaraderie at gary con that i think you don't get at a lot of other conventions. It's about having a good time. There's definitely a family feeling, having my brothers and sisters and I uh, hosting this event. It's really great that, that, we, that we get to do it. And so I think that is what's special is that you feel like you're not just a person in a crowd, you're amongst friends. So bring a friend and come and play some games with us. to Gary Khan and welcome to D&D &D to Savage Worlds in 60 Minutes. We are going to talk about how we can take you from D&D &D into Savage Worlds in 60 Minutes. Now, to be clear, this is not about preaching how D&D &D is awful or how Savage Worlds is better. All of us here uh, play D&D &D as well. We love it. That's where a lot of us even started. Uh, we enjoy it just as well as, as Savage Worlds. Uh, and um, if you enjoy D&D, &D, please continue enjoying D&D. What this discussion is, is about is how to change your mindset when you read or sit down to play Savage Worlds. But first, let's introduce ourselves so that you know who we are and why you should or shouldn't care about what we have to say <laughs> on this topic. Uh, I'll let you go first, Ron. Sure. Um, I'm Ron Blessing. Uh, I've been playing Savage Worlds since 2003 when it came out. Um, I've been working on the, uh, uh, on the game in one capacity or another since about 2008. Um, and I currently host a podcast called Savage Interludes. And uh, based on the title, you might be able to tell that is a, a show about Savage Worlds. SavageInterludes.com. Plug. Yeah, Carl. Hi, I'm, I'm Carl Kiesler, and uh, I've been playing Savage Worlds probably the same length as Ron has. And I'm part of Doghouse Rules, where we have uh, we make Savage Worlds products, and in the early days, we made a lot of D20 products. Um, and I also do freelance graphic design for Pinnacle, and um, I am also on the Pathfinders for Savage Worlds team, um, where I did a lot of art for that, and we talk about rules and stuff. And I am also on a podcast too called the Wild Eye Podcast, which is all about Savage Worlds. That's right. And I'm Christian Serrano. Uh, I used to have a podcast called uh, Savage Bloggers Network. Actually, Ron was was my co-host. Coincidentally, uh, one of my interviewees or one of our interviewees was uh, Carl Kiesler, uh, <laughs> where we talked about some of the crazy awesome props and character sheets that he's done for con games. He is a graphic designer, and if you get a chance, just Google his Mystery Men character sheets or any of his League of Extraordinary Gentlemen 70s edition or whatever. Uh, it's it's crazy. The talent that this man has is, is unbelievable. Um, I, have, I was also a co-host of Manifest zone uh, the uh, podcast about eberron with uh, keith baker wayne chang and imogen Jinjel, and um you get to see us a little bit later on uh, today as well um and i've done eberron for savage worlds which is uh a, an adaptation that i did um for for converting a D, &D based game into a savage worlds paradigm so 
I should point out that that's amazing, and it's yeah. completely. Uh, what I love is that it's completely legal, and it's been blessed, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was fortunate to get the uh, the the approval from Wizards of the Coast to uh, to do that, and uh, they they were very kind about that Un- under their fan content policy. To be clear, right. Um, <laughs> So, with all, did I miss anything? Is there anything I missed about you guys? That's that's really cool. Uh, that's I mean, you guys are just pretty cool as it is. So. <laughs> no. I don't know that you need to be any cooler. But. Uh, all right, reach so max coolness for a gamer. <laughs> that's yeah, right. that's, that's it. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. So, um, where to start? Uh, where where do you think if somebody's coming to Savage Worlds, uh, what's the most obvious starting point that you guys think um, you know someone should someone should begin with? Well, try to. Um, first of all with with the way the the world is right now it's so easy to to watch people playing it online and there's a lot of great ways to do that um i recommend anything that's been uh done by a group called uh, the wild cards um they do an amazing job with savage worlds and uh so that's one thing you can do if you want to see it played obviously you can watch us play later today um but i also recommend um you know, once the world opens up again, uh, get in a con game, get in a convention mm-hmm. game, uh, sit down and play. Uh, Savage Worlds convention uh, GMs are cream of the crop, in my opinion, and uh, they they tend to really love the system and are willing to teach it. Uh, so it's, it's so it's yeah. a great experience. Yeah, I know uh, Pinnacle has a Twitch channel now, and there are right. some videos on there too of, of recently played i i ran one for uh, pathfinder for savage worlds Mm -hmm. that's on there but as ron said cons cons are a perfect way to get into savage worlds yeah Uh, just sign up for a game um and and see how the system plays you know like you said it's it's a lot of fun if you get a good gm they can they can really make the system shine for you yeah no absolutely yeah. Yeah. and i think something we'll we'll talk about later is uh you know savage worlds lends itself to a lot more risk taking mm-hmm. uh and, and we'll we'll get into why that is um but con games are especially really good for that like where you can just yeah. really go all out and take you know yeah. crazy risks and actions because you know it's a one shot right you don't care about your character's longevity <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah it's i agree i think i think cons is a great way to sort of dip your toe in the water before you you dive into it um right. I will say one of the things I, I love is that um, Pinnacle is very generous with the PDF of the core rules um, and that it's $10 only. Uh, if you buy a copy of the hard book, uh, the hardcover from their shop, they'll even give you the PDF for free. A lot of, you know, some yeah. more and more publishers are doing that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great way to get people, uh, you know, started and into it. Um, yep. Well, and the best part is if you buy the PDF first and, and you decide later that you want the book, you're only at an extra 10 bucks. Yeah. Um, and, right. and, uh, yeah it's it's a it's a beautiful book it's um the the current version of it that just came out recently there was over a three hundred thousand dollar kickstarter um uh the the suede and christian's holding it up right there (laughs) and um that is uh brilliantly laid out in terms of um how the information's you know uh, given to you in the book Uh, the big thing i would say if you're going to just read the savage worlds book um read through it and don't try not to form any opinions on rules changes Mm -hmm. uh, that you might want to make as you're reading through the book play it as written because it's it sounds unintuitive but if you play through it first you'll you'll have a much un- better understanding of the rules and, and you might find there's uh, very fewer things that you, you might want yeah. to tweak. Yeah, yeah for it, sure. It reads weird. It, I, I'll be honest. <laughs> like, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, what? Cards? Why am I using <laughs> cards for initiative? Why don't I just roll a D20? Um, but when you actually play it, 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 you see how it comes together and it plays brilliantly and it's and it has a lot of consistency through it too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I think Ron's right. Like, you know, play through it try it as is before you jump to trying to change something just because you thought it read weird. Um, and it is, it's, it's a very holistic system. Like it all neatly fits together. You, you change something and it can have a pretty big impact uh, throughout it. And, I, and, that, and that's a good thing because we'll, we'll talk about setting rules probably later on uh, where different genres and different settings might have a different tweak to certain rules 
so that they accommodate that genre or they accommodate a certain style of play or a certain experience of play. So. Right. So one, one thing I, I'll say too is um, you mentioned it briefly, Christian, but the, but the tight paradigm that the Savage Worlds rules works under is so consistent that, and this is one of my favorite features, is if you don't remember a rule, you can make it up on the fly and I would say nine times out of 10, when you go back to the book, you either nailed it dead on or got mm -hmm. really close because it's just consistent with the way the system works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another piece of advice that I've, I've given before in the past is um, off, often it's easy to try to play Dungeons and Dragons or whatever D20 system you're using yeah. through Savage Worlds. People often want to play... D and D, but with Savage Worlds, and the part of the shift is to not think about the mechanics like that Warlock Eldritch Blast or whatever, but think about the feel of the character and what what that ability represents or what the story that you're trying to tell about that character. Yeah, and then yeah. use the Savage Worlds paradigm to define that. You know, use use Savage Worlds to play the setting, not the system. Yeah, that was that was one thing, Shane really wanted to bring home when we're work when we were working on the uh, savage you know pathfinder for savage worlds is we want the feel of savage worlds but with these cool adventure paths that pathfinder has not vice versa like you're not trying to shoehorn those rules into savage worlds they're two complete separate rule sets right because there's want already a pathfinder if you want exactly pathfinder, play pathfinder. Yeah. exactly yeah, exactly and Shane will be the first to tell you, enjoy Pathfinder. It's a great game. We love it. Yeah. You know, go enjoy it. And, you know, yep. so, yeah, I, I think you're spot on there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that, that I think throws people off is that when you look at Savage Worlds, a lot of the base edge names and things like that, they are very, so there's no implied setting. And they, they can feel very modern. They can feel very pulpy or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you really look at what's happening mechanically, they're no different than what you're getting in D&D &D in most cases. Uh, and I think Pathfinder even did, Savage Pathfinder, I should say, did something like this where they have, in the core rules for Savage Worlds, Two Gun Kid and, um, I forgot what the other one was, Two Fisted. And Pathfinder just said, you know what, we're going to make this one edge and we're gonna, just going to call it Two Weapon Fighting. It's the same exact thing, same mechanics. We're just naming it something appropriate for what suits the setting and the genre. Uh, so I think I think that's that's something to keep in mind when you read that book, when you read those core rules, it's not going to speak to a particular setting. Um, you might infer it, but you know, being open minded, I think, is a good thing. So one other one other tip about starting before we move on to the next uh, the next section because I know we're going to talk about that. But yeah, um, when you're introducing your your friends to Savage Worlds, um, to speak to the whole don't play D and D. Um, and Christian and I differ on this. Um, I've had better success just completely not even running fantasy mm -hmm. for my players. I'll run a completely different system so they can get their headspace out of D&D a little bit easier because it is a very different system. Um, I find Pulp Adventure, um, anything with uh, action uh, works great, um, but pretty much just... Just make sure you're not, to me, don't don't just, you know, do a standard dungeon crawl or, um, you know, that kind of thing. Now, if you want to do fantasy, work on the, you know, do something that Savage Worlds is great at to, to showcase it. Mm -hmm. Like do a yeah. big siege. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That yeah lots, of, lots of combatants on the map and <laughs> sweep through yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think that's fair. I think there's something to be said about using, and it's sort of like a palate cleansing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want to really get to know the system out of the context of a setting. And, and so trying something right. different can help, um, you know, and I, and, and I think it helps also to avoid that, that instinctive desire to draw comparisons. You right. know, and, and to, Absolutely. Um, but I, I also think, and this is, this is why Ron and I differ. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's possible for a GM to also facilitate that, to say, hey, I know you're thinking about this in this context. Mm -hmm. This is another way to think about it. You know, this is how we can reinterpret that. This is how, like, you know, a good example might be uh, in 3.5 Sonics, there were mind blades, right, soul knives. Um, mm -hmm. Well, 
you at a at a base level in the core rules, you have something like smite, which you can put on say your hands, right? Or and and it's you can say, you know, describe it as like this weapon that you manifest on your on your hands. Uh, or you can go and buy Ron's supplement, <laughs> uh, Warrior <laughs> Adept, uh, which has something very similar to that. Um, so there's, and that's just to show that there are um, there are multiple ways of handling that that same thing. You know, and, and it's very flexible in that regard. It's all about how you see it in your mind and how right. you interpret what's happening mechanically. Right. And that's a concept that's part of the par- the paradigm of Savage Worlds, which is trappings. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is all about how you present it. Um, the mechanics fade into the background and, um, you know, you present it from that trappings standpoint of, Hey, I know it's called smite, but this is how it looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carl, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I do that in my con games. What the, like Christian mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, mystery man, I ran a mystery man convention game where you play the characters from the movies. Well, in order to do some of those powers, like, um, the blue Raja, he throws, he throws forks and knives like cutlery <laughs> so i use the bolt power super simple it just retrapped yep. it and said instead of fireballs it's forks <laughs> you know yeah. and it's spoons. the same thing yeah spoons and stuff like that and you should see some of the players really get into that and say well i want to do this with that you know like he does in the movie where he makes like a kind of like a ladder with the forks and stuff like that they it's it's pretty interesting to see how you can play with that and and yeah and use that difference, you know, the trappings in different yeah. ways. So. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, and, and to the point earlier about like, you know, there, there being core rules to suit different genres and different settings, mm-hmm. they, they, they are, un- they're not universal rules to be right. clear. This isn't like GURPS where it's like you use the exact same verbatim rules for every genre and setting. Right. They're core rules and they're intended to be modified and adjusted to suit the setting or the genre so you know it, it's important to not read those rules and feel like you're hand hamstrung or handcuffed to a specific interpretation of things um if you if the name of the edge rubs you the wrong way rename the edge for your setting you know, it's as and as and that. and you know while we say savage worlds rules aren't universal i can tell you personally that i've played everything from you know um, high fantasy uh, you know pulp adventure sword and sorcery eldritch horror and everything in between yeah Uh, supers um you can you you can really with the through the lens of adventure do pretty much anything with with the system yeah i agree yep indeed so the other thing i think people will notice right off the Get, uh, right off the bat, I'll say right off the gate. That's mixing metaphors there. <laughs> right off the bat, out of the uh, bat. <laughs> right. uh, but the, it's the lack of classes. Like with D and D, it's like, okay, well, where's my barbarian? Where's right. my warlock? Where's my you know whatever bard? That's right. Uh, and Savage Worlds has no class, no class at all. It's classless. <laughs> School classes. in the summertime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no class. No class. <laughs> Um, it is, uh, it is much more build oriented in terms of, uh, abilities and skills, mm-hmm. um, which is great because I think, I think that can be, that can feel very liberating for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. it's a low key point by system, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And by low key, I mean, they're not like, you know, the book doesn't say, all right, you've got 150 points. It's not <laughs> like that. It's literally spend five points on your attributes, spend right? 15 points on your you know skills and that there were 12 points i'm sorry i was yeah swayed now yeah and then <laughs> here's an, here's a few extra for taking those hindrances and exactly go take some edges and right. yeah we're, right. i think you're dealing with a total of maybe 25 points in different contexts something uh, like that with, you know i think five for bill you're gonna make me do math man come on <laughs> oh, it's, like, it's, it's not a lot guys it's less than 20 <laughs> yeah 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 and just then, say that um, but it's but it's really flexible. And what's really cool is that the the start of that creation process, what I love, uh, is kind of with hindrances, in yeah. many ways. And it's yeah. this this concept of, you know, creating a character that is flawed, but is capable despite the flaws. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and uh, and and it, it, I have seen over the years some of the most interesting takes on hindrances that players have come up with, like mm-hmm. really cool creative ways of expressing those ideas and and. Uh, really making their characters come to life as a result. 
what Even I like about game. yeah yeah what what I like about hindrances too is it gives the game master something to key off of mm -hmm. uh, when building adventures. So this is the advantage of playing at a regular table rather than just con games necessarily is um, those hindrances are there for the game master. The reason hindrances are great for the for the players at a con game, you can look at the hindrances and if they're not mechanical and they're more a role-playing hindrance, they're named aptly. Like everybody mm -hmm. knows what mean means. There's a hindrance called mean where your character doesn't know how to get along well with others um, kind of thing. And uh, they're great cues to help you play a character. You don't have to, you know, read a three page background to understand who this character is when you sit down to play. You can get into it real quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're great cues for the game master too to oh, yeah. hold exactly. that Benny up and say, hey, yeah. Aren't you uh, hesitant? Aren't you not right. gonna maybe go in there, or aren't or you? One mean? of my favorites. Aren't you? Aren't you curious? Don't yes. You, don't you? Don't you kind of want to go in there and check? Yeah. That out? Put it your hand a... in that hole there. It'll be fine. You yeah. want it? You want it? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and and we'll we'll talk a little bit about Benny's and uh, when we get into combat and whatnot and, and what that means. But hindrances also helps with that because the uh, you are rewarded. Uh, Benny's for playing to your hindrances and that encourages that like th those hindrances should be dangerous in some cases yeah. you know and and I think that adds to the story and adds to, to the development of the characters um yeah um so the, the you know the, I guess the last thing about the the class structure or the lack of classes it can be intimidating I think for people coming from d20 or D&D um, where you want something that's structured and tells you this is what this archetype is about, this is what this character type is about, um, this is what they can do, and so on. Um, and that I think that's understandable. What are some of the tips that you've given, or the, as a GM, or to people who are looking to get into Savage Worlds to sort of work with that? Well, honestly, um, I always when when you're making a character, um, I always start with. Uh, a character from a, from a show or movie or comic book or book that you're interested in and um, adapt some of that like when mm -hmm. I'm playing a mean character um, I think of Dr. Cox from Scrubs so it helps me out you know that kind of thing um, so whatever you're starting with just think about those those traits and 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 build those into your character yeah um when you're when you're playing the big thing from a from the standpoint of that i think is very different about savage worlds is it's got a lot of subsystems and i hate the word subsystems but i don't have a better one right now um that let you do those different things that are kind of a pain in a lot of rpgs um things like mass battles uh, things like chases. Um, there's there's a really great kind of universal one um, called uh, Quick Encounters. And these are all designed to have those really cool action scenes that aren't quite just regular combat, but are still action-packed and fun. And utilizing those uh, is easy because it goes back to that paradigm. They all still work on those base savage worlds rules a lot of game systems out there tend to bolt on more rules um older editions of DD did that um a lot of other game systems out there uh, i love how in savage worlds they they stay close to the to the to the paradigm of the game yeah yeah, yeah. it's like they leverage that that those core concepts like you still have mm -hmm. Your, your trait roles, you still have bennies, you still have raises and successes, and yeah, so yeah. on. Yeah, it's a it's a usability thing yeah. um, that that uh, is is really great, right? Right, Carl. Um, so with classes, um, I the way I kind of describe it to when my players want to when we start a new game, Savage Worlds game, and we want to kind of build characters and stuff. We usually have a session zero, of course, and we talk about it, but I always tell them, think of an archetype, kind of like what Ron was saying. Think of something like a classic, like if we're playing a fantasy game, like uh, a classic, like uh, uh, 
tracker with a bow or something like that, like an Aragon type character. Think about what that looks like to these rules. And I could guide you to where that might be. Like it might take mm -hmm. the woodsman edge, you know, that's an edge that, that lets them, you know, use survival and stuff like that. There might be different things like he, so there's all kinds of edges in there that to, can help that and can build upon that, but it's not a specific class where you're, where you're kind of shoehorned and you have to go a certain direction. Right. You know, you can you can veer off however you want to, even with the uh, uh, what the guys did with this Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. Again, there are class edges in there like you can play a barbarian class edge, but it's limited. It only gives you some stuff and it doesn't mean you can't. Oh, I want to be like a rogue now. So I want to go off and maybe bump some skills into thievery or mm -hmm. something like that. You know, yeah. it's it's not so limited where okay i'm a barbarian that's it no you can do whatever you want to yeah you know and and go about how you want to build your character your version yeah. of that whatever you see and and bouncing off of that a little bit too um there's a specific type of edge in core savage worlds called the uh professional edge mm -hmm. and if you have a general concept for your character there's probably a professional edge that would work and when you're building one of your first characters, those give you a great guideline for what you need for that character to make that professional edge work because they have yeah. these requirements. Um, so you know that if you were to take the thief edge, you you want to have, um, you know, thievery, and you're going to want to have a decent agility and stuff like that. Right. Um, and stealth and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So those are those are the things to 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 uh, keep in mind. I think. I think the. Uh the the background edges also contribute to that as yeah. well so for example we should, you, you know have... what Th this is a D, D thing we should as well we should probably mention specifically that edges are the equivalent of feats and stuff yeah and and yeah. class abilities right right yeah. right. Yeah. right so for example the a background edge i was just going to mention is the berserk uh background edge mm -hmm. which is your rage you know yep. and i know in pathfinder for example they actually took that and they tweaked it a little bit so that it can be more of a an at will kind of a thing rather than uh, something that's triggered by a wound, but but the concept is the same. It's you know we in these background edges you have um, arcane backgrounds. So if you want to play a spellcaster of some sort, there's different arcane backgrounds you can pick. There's you know, berserk. If you want to play somebody who came from nobility or a wealthy family, you know, they have background edges for that as well. Right. Um, and that kind of helps to flesh out those little details uh, for and, and totally and benefits you yeah. know for the character. Uh, and I think I think Carl and Ron, you're both right about. Um, thinking about the concept like you know you mentioned the mean hindrance and i think about like you know mad mardigan you know from mm -hmm. willow yeah that guy you know <laughs> he was not a nice guy he's also uh, arrogant he's yes. also arrogant he's arrogant two, ha <laughs> two hindrances right there yeah uh, major <laughs> i am the greatest swordsman that has ever lived <laughs> right right oh val kilmer we love you <laughs> so um so yeah so i think i think those are two good starting points for um for facilitating uh, finding those classes, so quote unquote. Um, but I, I, I do think that people who look for that rigidity or or, the, or not rigidity, I'm sorry, that guidance, um, I think they'll appreciate the openness of of Savage Worlds uh, mm -hmm. edges and such. And the hindrances, like you just said, like yeah, that could be a, a great starting point for like a class, unquote. You know, like. Like what you said, you know, I'm the great yeah. sword fighter. So let's start with those hindrances first. Start with that, right? Hindrances yeah. are the hidden gem. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the I things I, I really liked when I first read Savage Worlds was how many things that were like, only rogues can do this thing. <laughs> but it was like, oh, anybody can get the drop, which is just a combat option. Right. You know, and that's, that's something anybody can do. Rogues can do it better because they have, you know, a higher stealth skill more likely. Mm -hmm. um, sure but it's not like you have to be a rogue to be able to do that kind of a thing. But you could also play a super sneaky wizard in Savage Worlds. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, you just have a so wizard with a high stealth. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody that knows how to walk quietly, I'm a big guy. I'm quieter to walk around this house than anybody in my house. <laughs> and I'm, I'm no less than twice as big as everybody in my house. Yeah. Right. And so, so I'm a big fat guy that has stealth. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i got the drop on Carl at a con a couple years ago i'm just saying yeah <laughs> i was like what who's who's behind me? what's going on 
<laughs> so, uh, so the other thing I want to talk about is um, powers. Uh, in D&D, we have, I mean, there's been whole books dedicated to just spells, like or half a book dedicated oh, to spells. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's interesting, I, I saw Shane Hensley talk about this in an interview recently where he, you know, when he worked for TSR at one point, he was actually trying to find a way where he himself could create a codified system for, um, you know, distilling spells down to, okay, at this level you can do this much damage kind of a thing. Um, and just really distilling them down to their core essence. And that's right. sort of what he did with Savage Worlds, where the the powers, the list of powers is really, really minimal um, compared to D&D. And I think that might throw some people off. They're like, well, where is, you know, like levitate? I don't have levitate. Okay, well, maybe it's just a trapping of, say, telekinesis. Or it's yeah. fly. With or it's fly. Fly <laughs> with certain things <laughs> attached to it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so what that means is that um, the powers in Savage Worlds are core concepts, and it's it's nuts and bolts. This is the effect mechanically. Right. How that looks and how that works and how you manifest it or activate it is where the trappings that we spoke about earlier come into play. Mm-hmm. And, and and you're encouraged to rename the powers. Of course. To, uh, to yeah. What you're doing. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where you, you take that power, you give it the trapping that you want, and you say this is Christian's mighty Benny tossing bolt, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it could be anything or forks, right? It's throwing forks. Um, I, exactly. Attacked by poker chips. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, but it, it's it's whatever you call it, and you give it that spin. Um, the important thing to know though is that, um, and this is I think this Benny's. is a benefit as well as a limitation. Um, but when you take that power, you only assign one trapping to it. There's some yes. exceptions with edges and such. But like if I take a bolt of fire and then I want to take a bolt of ice, that's a separate power. I have to take that later on uh, mm-hmm. or, or as a separate power slot. Right. Kind of. um, and I, th- I think that's cool because it really emphasizes that flexibility and it yeah. emphasizes how you know we can use that same baseline to produce different effects. So do you guys have any, any other thoughts on that? No, I, I think the powers for me are are um, are brilliant. One difference that people will note is that instead of having spell slots, you do um, have uh, PowerPoints in most cases. Mm-hmm. There's some ways to not use PowerPoints, but that's probably more than we want to cover in this. Um, but in general, you have PowerPoints and you just cast whatever powers or spells that you, uh, you want to. Yeah. If you're familiar with uh, D&D 3.5, psionics you'll be familiar with yeah. this because they had yeah. modifiers it's very similar where, there. where you can augment and it was powerpoint right. based so you could you could spend additional points to get an additional effect you know uh, yeah. out of the power um, so for example there might be a power where it's like you know you select a target but then there's a modifier where for like i can't remember if it's one or two additional power points you can affect multiple targets per right. like one point per target i think or something like that um, so just as an example, uh, or you yeah. can increase a small burst template into a medium or large burst template uh, to cover more area. So. Yeah. Um, and there's also cool ways to, to adjust them and reduce the PowerPoint cost with like limitations and uh, you know things like that. Um, the I think the cool thing that gets over often overlooked is the generic modifiers that are at the beginning of that chapter which are modifiers that can apply to any power. So for example, you can have a bolt power that might also create light, right? Yeah. Or it might be armor piercing or something to that effect. And, uh, yeah. and I, I think that's- Knocks that's people where, down, you know, right. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's where you can tweak them. Like if you're coming from D&D and you want a magic missile to a fireball to whatever, mm-hmm. you know, y- you can, tweak those dials with those different rules to kind of make that version of bolt or whatever kind of mimic, you know, maybe a magic missile or or something. If you want to do some sort of necrotic damage, you can Mm -hmm. cause fatigue on top of the damage, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Which is nasty, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think, I think one of the cool things that uh, we should definitely touch on before the, the end of this is um, combat and how all that sort of flows. Um, so one of the things that, that you'll notice is, for example, you d- uh, you don't have the massive amount of hit points. Not that starting characters in D&D have a massive amount of hit points, because they don't. <laughs> but uh, you know, you don't, we don't track individual points 
for damaging a creature or or damage or if you take wounds and such Mm -hmm. Um, you, you take wounds you take wounds that are really only the significant wounds that you're tracking and it sort of minimizes that bookkeeping in many ways um uh you have uh you have a roll to hit the target and you have a roll to damage the target whereas if we're coming from D D D is more of you just rolled a hit and if you hit you did damage period end of story uh with savage worlds you might have hit them but it might not have been a significant amount of damage to have really hindered them in any way it's like a graze or something to that effect um yeah yeah so you know the the parry which is derived from your fighting we, we're not going to get into all the details about how to calculate derived traits but right. parry is derived from your fighting skill and uh when you're trying to make a melee attack against a target for example it's going to be against that parry if that succeeds then you get to roll your damage against their toughness which is also derived from their vigor um with each success in a raise uh success is you hit the target number um and on a raise is four over and that's throughout the entire system anytime you want to roll you 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 can possibly get a raise um but if you get a raise or multiple raises that can cause wounds and then where it really gets deadly and this is where players kind of need to be careful those wounds induce penalties and so you start taking a minus death one spiral. Um, the death spiral. That's right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so you get minus one for one wound, minus two for two wounds, minus three for three wounds. At the fourth wound, you're incapacitated, right? That's like you're knocked out kind of. Right. And there's a very serious risk of possible death. So I think I th- the reason why I'm bringing all that up is because I think um, typically what I've seen players come from D&D, they, they, they do the thing where they all just huddle around the one bad guy or whatever it is. And or they they stand toe to toe and they just sit there and just wail on them, um, but then they get one hit and they go down and all of a sudden everybody's like, "What? Oh, this is awful. This game sucks." You know, whatever. Um, you really got to think about tactics in, in that regard. Um, Ron, you you were about to say something. I, I was just going to say the the big thing about it is that um, there's a couple of things in the game that can make it unpredictable in a great way and that is you've got uh an extra die that you roll with your so i should probably quickly explain the mechanics um you're going to roll a a trait die based on either a skill or your attribute that's going to be anywhere from d4 to d12 your standard uh dice uh, chain as i'd put it and then you get to roll a second die that's called the wild die and you keep the best of the two. And here's where things get a little crazy is if you roll the top number on a die, that's called acing. Um, Other game systems might call them exploding. And then you roll again and keep adding. And of the two dice you roll, um, you're going to keep the better of the two. And if one explodes, it just keeps going up until um, you get to your total. Mm -hmm. So, this is doubly fun with damage because all the damage dice get added together and those can explode as well. So uh, that's where that, that um, deadliness comes from. And it's also where the uh, unpredictability comes from. Mm -hmm. I would even go so far as to say excitement. Oh, it is. exciting. (laughs) Well, it's definitely exciting. Definitely. and you'll find if you go to a convention and go to whatever room they're playing Savage Worlds and there's a lot of whooping and hollering because <laughs> when <Dice> somebody explode. <laughs> explode, yeah, um, not literally, by the way, guys, it's <laughs> physical explosions, but in um, my head, they do <laughs> in my head. It's like, boom. But, but yeah, so, so keep that in mind that um, it may look like you're not, you don't have a great chance to, I've got a D8 and I need to roll uh, 12 to hurt this yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, it's super easy to explode. You have these things called bennies, which get you re-rolls and help you right. with soaking wounds. Um, that gives the players and the GM a little more control to bring that unpredictability, dial it back a little bit when you want to. Um, and so it's, it, it's combat can be so much fun for those reasons. Yeah. 
I know um, when I GM games and there is that, there is that what Christian said earlier that uh, when players come in from D and D or something and they might hit, but then they don't do enough damage to maybe not cause a wound or something like that, but it's up Mm -hmm. to the GM and even the players to think about, well, you did hit, but you just didn't do enough. So maybe describe it that way, you know, just have the GM, the GMs should be describing what that looks like. You know, yeah, maybe on, the maybe the Blue Raja accidentally threw a spoon instead of a fork. <laughs> exactly, <right>? exactly. <laughs> that's all he had available. Oh exactly. man, it was his grandmother's wooden spoon. That, that's not going to hurt very much from yeah. a distance. A ladle. Yeah. Not when you well, throw it. And when you think about parry, parry is like you know somebody actively trying to block a hit. It's not yeah. not getting through the armor. It's it's right. blocking the hit. So you just happen to to get past them trying to block the hit. Exactly. But your hit yeah. might not have been hard enough you know might have right. you know, slid across yeah. the armor plating or something like that but that's right. that's what the gm should be right. saying that you know you should say oh well you just missed well no let's how did i miss what happened you know let's right. let's get into that because that's that's all part of role playing you know in these cool games that we play yeah and there are a lot of combat options available to mm-hmm. um I, I guess facilitate or that sounds, that sounds like a weak word compared to what it actually does <laughs> but to really enhance your attacks uh, wild oh, yeah. attack is one of my favorites where you get a plus two to your attack and damage right. but you're leaving yourself a little vulnerable you know and, and uh but it's it pays off you know yeah a lot of things that are that are like maneuvers not maneuvers that might be feats in a D game um especially if you look at third edition uh are are just options that you can just any character yeah. can do in, right in a in Savage Worlds, instead of it being a feat or a class ability, it's it's just a thing you can say, "Hey, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to I'm going to wild attack, um, or I'm going to get the drop." And right, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm going to aim, aiming, yeah. just mm-hmm. you know, that gang, kind of up stuff. Bonuses. gang up yeah. bonuses. Oh, gang up is fun. You don't have yeah. to make sure you're on exact yeah. opposite sides. <laughs> you don't have to be a rogue. <laughs> you know, to, yeah, right. To get that right. gang up bonus, you just know. got to have greater numbers. That's it. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. so it's just very cinematic and exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, right. and, and that's, that's what I kind of love about that. Mm-hmm. Um, we should probably make some time to talk about some game mastering stuff. Yeah. Uh, so if we're real quick though, if you do want to get more into the details about the, the core mechanics, you can go to Pinnacle's website and download the free test drive rules. And they do cover things like initiative, bennies and, you know, attacks and die rolls and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and the test drive does come with, uh, Savage Worlds is flagship setting Deadlands, mm-hmm. um, and a, and a full adventure uh, to uh, to to play out, and yeah. it gives you a real good feel for the system. The test yeah. drive is pretty. It's how I started. Free, it's what sold me. It's pretty expansive. As soon yeah. as I read through that test drive back in two thousand eight, it, it was I was sold. I was All like, right. I'm, I ordered the book immediately. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah, right, so well, let's let's go let's, into game mastering. Um, Ron, did you want to lead that or? Well, I was just going to say straight up when you're when you're game mastering it, the big thing that's different from D twenty is there's a the paradigm of of character progression in D anD D is this: you go from zero to hero. Mm-hmm. Well, in Savage Worlds, you go from pretty darn good to eh, you're really <laughs> awesome now, and it's this <laughs> it's this like slight thing (laughs) which is why you don't have to worry about challenge ratings in savage worlds yeah you're literally um the players might just need to run right right right. yeah (laughs) a little more old school in that way that might be the case later today when i run my savage eberron game Uh (laughs) Uh i don't don't run in con games dude you're just gonna have to get over it (laughs) so carl you you've gm'd a ton of of sessions at cons and whatnot yeah uh what what do you what are your thoughts on this Um, my thoughts are, uh, like for D20 type, yeah, props, bring cool minis and maps and, no, and wild hours and hours and hours (laughs) making them. Yeah. No, my, my thing is that, uh, like a D20 type game, they are, the, the, the scenes are different. Okay. D20 games are more geared towards slowly wearing down the group's resources and stuff like that as a uh, savage worlds are, are mm-hmm. games are usually bigger set pieces, bigger battles, like really cool stuff happening, like all at once. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a little different. Um, but uh, 
my biggest thing too about for GMs, if you're going to GM uh, games, is use those, spend those bennies or give them to the players. I mean, you know, give those bennies to players because uh, that that's the economy of the game. Really, is the uh, the benny economy is to to keep the right. action rolling with those. You know, I think I think that you're you're right about that. And a lot of first time GMs are really shy about bennies. They're worried yeah. it's going to uh, unbalance things. It's not. <laughs> and um uh yeah don't don't hesitate it, it i've ended games at cons for example or even just with my players where they just have like a stack of bennies that's fine right you know um encourage them that they use or encourage your players to use them uh and uh don't be reluctant to hand them out um it's hard to keep track of when to hand them out sometimes as a gm because you're yeah. you're managing so much i tend to try to do like a nomination system right. um where you know players can nominate each other or themselves you know just i tell them don't be afraid to say hey i think i should have gotten a benny for that <laughs> i think that's fair you know and, yeah. and uh, absolutely you know and and Very you're cool. right about the the bigger set pieces the combat encounters are much more significant right. uh, whereas in dnd we have a lot of little encounters because you know mm -hmm. we're doing like at, you know, uh, attrition you know based play um, and that's a feature of dnd that's fine and, and that has its uh, has its own uh rewards for playing and, and such its own strategies yeah, exactly. And um, but in Savage Worlds, we focus more on the the impactful encounters uh, of, of of that story. So, um, yeah. So so wrapping up, uh, are are there any last minute thoughts that we have um, regarding GMing or, or or the system? No, I just oh. I just think join a con game or an online game. Those are pretty common right. yeah. these days. Yeah, and uh, yeah. And have at it, and just yeah. just don't try to make it be D and D. Play a different game and have fun with it. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And um, and hit the forums, hit the communities online. Uh, people are super helpful in our community. Um, they'll they'll help you think about how how to approach different things. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't I don't think anybody uh, has ever had any real issue with that. It's it's always been super helpful. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, this has been oh, fun, guys. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Good times. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, again, uh, try out Savage Worlds. Check out the test drive rules, and um, yeah, stay savage. I guess. <laughs> All right, thank savage. you, everybody. Enjoy the con, and um, yeah, see you around. Hello, Gary Con. If you haven't seen me before, my name is Theo, and I'm the co-proprietor of the Gallant Goblin. You can find us everywhere really, but our main base of operations is over on YouTube where we showcase and review everything TTRPG. From minis like these, to terrain, to accessories like dice and dice towers, to adventures and source books. And over the years, we fell in love with the products put out by Steamforged Games in particular. And eventually, they became one of our sponsors and supporters. And I was really happy when they reached out to me and were like, Hey, Theo, can you talk to the folks attending GaryCon this year about all the cool stuff we've been making for 5e? And of course, I couldn't be happier to. So today, I want to tell you mainly about their epic encounter boxes. These are RPG Night in a Box, and they're great for both new and experienced GMs. Now, I only have time here to give you a brief overview of what each set contains, but if you want to see more, come find the Gallant Goblin over on YouTube, where we have full reviews of these, plus some 200-odd other reviews so far that I hope you'll enjoy. Now, in broad strokes, each of these boxes contains everything you need to run a one-shot or mini-campaign with your group using the 5th edition rules that you already know. You get awesome unpainted minis like these that you can reuse in future adventures, you get a great double-sided map, and you get an adventure book. They're all designed to be really versatile, so if you're truly running a one-shot adventure for a new group, maybe at a con, then this will make it really easy. But each one also gives you lots of potential story hooks that'll allow you to drop it into your ongoing campaigns very smoothly. So maybe if one of your key players can't attend a session or two of your Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frostmaiden campaign, you can just pull one of these off your shelf and run the other players through a little side session involving a frost giant instead of having to continue the main plot of your adventure without having everyone there, but you can still have an epic time. Now, the Epic Encounters line here releases in pairs. For each set, you get a warband box and a boss box. And they're pretty different, actually, and not just because one features 20 cool smaller minis and the other one has one giant big boss mini. 
Let me show you what I mean by introducing the first set of boxes, Shrine of the Cobalt Queen and Lair of the Red Dragon. Shrine of the Cobalt Queen introduces you to Mother Krangor, a winged cobalt seer who fills her followers with a fiery passion to remake the world in fire in the image of her dragon idol. She's brought along quite a crew as well. Not only do you get cobalt spearmen, cobalt archers, dual dagger wielding cobalt assassins, a mighty cobalt champion, and a fiery cobalt caster, but you also get kobolds riding bloody fire snakes and a big chonky basilisk with two cobalt handlers. There's a big map that features a cobalt encampment on one side and their caverns on the other. And finally, you get the adventure book, which like all the epic encounter books is adaptable to different tiers of play depending on the level of your party. Lead writer Richard August gives you all the stat blocks you need, of course, and leads you through an adventure confronting Mother Kringor.